If you are considering using CBD, THC, or marijuana in your practice, stop. You need to hear the truth. I'm Dr. Ross Carter with the Regenerative Warriors Show. Hi, welcome to the Regenerative Warrior Show. My name is Dr. Ross Carter. I want to welcome our guest, Dr. Ken Finn, to the show. Thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you for having me. Today's show is going to be a little different than our normal positive, pro, you know, happy, you know, try this. This is awesome. This will help your practice. This is actually kind of a, a warning and um, about the use of um, – uh, CBD as well as um, marijuana, if you can, you know, use that in the practice. So, uh, Dr. Finn, you you are a expert in this area, and so can you can you give us a little breakdown, kind of an overview of what what's going on here? Because this is something I, I was unaware of that was going on, and can you give me a kind of an overview of, of what's happening? Well, there's a lot, <clears throat> you know, as you know, I'm in Colorado, I've been here for going on 27 years and I served on our state committees um, the, when we legalized marijuana. I served on our state's medical marijuana council um, because I believe in rigor and research. Uh, the, the, what I've learned, and again, this, this was not really my career choice. I really was not too keen on becoming an international subject matter expert on pot. Um, <laughs> honestly, I, but what I've learned through uh, my anecdotal experience with patients, what I've learned through reading the literature um, is that this is not all uh, butterflies and rainbows. And it's not about uh, marijuana is going to fix your state's uh, monetary woes. This has really become a public health and safety concern. Uh, This has become another addiction for profit industry that is potentially targeting youth. Uh, We already have several legal substances available and we've done a terrible job with all of them. Uh, We've got alcohol, bad. We've got opioids, problem. We have tobacco, lung cancer, you know, and, and, and death. And nobody has been able to explain to me how and why this will be any different. And, you know, I was thinking this morning uh, not about our conversation, but it, it came up during Rotary when I spoke to our local Rotary uh, about an hour ago. I've never heard of a nicotine-related driving fatality. I've never heard of that. It doesn't happen. But well, unless it, you uh, drop your cigarette while you're driving, right. you burn your leg. You, you burn your leg, or you're trying to put put it out in the ashtray. Uh, but that would be a very rare bird. Uh, but in 2018 alone, Colorado had 144 marijuana-related driving fatalities. Because they were high in driving. And 70% of the Colorado survey of over 11,000 marijuana users admitted they drive high Oh my goodness. in the state of Colorado. So, you know, we don't want people getting behind the wheel when they drink. Right. And we don't want them taking opioids and getting behind the wheel. But every, the perception is that marijuana is safe, that you're going to be a safer driver, but 33% of the marijuana-related fatalities were marijuana only in Colorado. It causes impairment. It, it changes your depth perception. It slows your reaction time. So there are definitely some concerns from a public health and safety perspective. And then driving is just one piece. I mean, if, if, as a pain medicine physician and a, and a specialist, we don't want our patients on lots of drugs. You right. know, we've done a terrible job with opioids and we don't, we no longer have an opioid epidemic. We have a, a, a polysubstance drug problem in this country. And for example, and keep this in mind, that Colorado's had medical marijuana since 2001. So we're 19 years deep right. into medical marijuana. More than 90% of the marijuana recommendations were for pain. But in 2019, Colorado had a record number of opioid overdose deaths a record number, and it's continued to increase every year. So you would think if, if most of the cards were for pain, 
we should have some of the lowest opioid overdose deaths right. over time. So for instance, um, in just between 2018, 2019, prescription opioid fatalities, overdoses went up 24% in one year in Colorado. Fentanyl deaths went up 115% in one year. And we've seen ongoing rises in heroin, methamphetamine, and cocaine-related overdoses. So we have a polysubstance drug problem in our country. Um, and my, my feeling is that marijuana has been kind of the passive overseer of all this because it's considered very benign. People don't really die from smoking too much pot. They'll probably fall asleep first. Right. Um, but, they, but it is potentially a gateway drug. I mean, people can argue both sides of the coin on that. Uh, but you got the driving fatalities. We have our opioid epidemic. We have adolescent use and addiction. Uh, one of the centers in, at UC Health in Denver um, take a guess at what percent of kids are there for cannabis use disorder at, at, the, at a hospital at the at the inpatient uh, substance use treatment center associated oh, with substance health. yes I don't know adolescents 12 to 18 12 to 18 probably 19 so you, I guess you call them adolescents before they hit 20 but adolescent 20, substance 25 percent 97 okay I'm a little off 90, 97% of the kids there are being treated for cannabis use disorder. And I, the, the, the physician I know there, Dr. Christian Thurstone, I always, I always am, am skeptical of the number. I'm like, that seems so high. That does. It seems very high. And I ask him every single time I present to a, a big audience, um, I go, Christian, is it, is it really 97%? I always get a response, yes. That's pretty much all he sees. So what is cannabis disorder? I mean, I don't even know what that is. Um, well, it's addictive. Um, it, I mean, just this is following the same playbook as big tobacco. Uh, mm -hmm. When they the, the big manufacturer said it's nicotine's not addictive, right. nicotine's not addictive. You, you're you're probably old enough to remember the hearings on that. But them um, all saying, "Yeah, we're, we're I I I don't believe it's addictive. I don't believe it's addictive. Yes. It was all a lie. All a lie. And the same. This is the same playbook because the the public the public thought is that it's not addictive. Right. Um, and, and you and I probably both know people that can drink and be fine. They can probably take an opioid a couple times and be fine. Uh, or they can smoke cigarettes and be fine. Uh, not everybody that gets be behind the wheel of a car after going to a bar is going to get in a car crash. Right. So, right. But that being said, marijuana does have addictive qualities. It has a very well-known and documented withdrawal syndrome that kind of follows very similar to other substance withdrawal with anxiety, agitation, restlessness. Uh, sleeplessness, that sort of stuff, kind of peaks in a few days, tapers down after a few days. Um, and it's a, it's a billable code for cannabis withdrawal. Uh, cannabis use disorder is a billable code. I mean, it, it's a real thing. Okay. So let, let's say a physician is like, well, okay, fine. Then we just won't use the THC of marijuana and we'll just use the CBD. We should be set there, right? Because there's tons of research that's saying that CBD is, you know, the solution for everything. So if we just take out the THC, haven't we solved the problem? Yes and no. Um, you know, CBD is non-psychoactive. It's not going to get you high. I think based on animal models, we know how it has potential benefit as an anti-inflammatory agent uh, with, from a scientific perspective, with signaling in the central nervous system, modulating certain neurotransmitters that may modulate pain. That's all awesome right? But if you, we have one, there's one FDA approved CBD on the planet, at least in the U.S., called Epidiolex. Um, it's, it's FDA approved, it's purified, has no contaminants. Is uh, that something you would get at a pharmacy? You get it at a pharmacy. Okay. Comes through a window. I'm not a big fan of pharma. I'll put that out there. I'm not a big fan of big insurance, big pharma. Okay. I'm not a fan. Okay. But Epidiolex is a um, purified cannabidiol uh, that comes from a pharmacy it's a, you know how we dose it, and it's for a very narrow spectrum of pediatric seizure uh, called Lennox Gastaut and Dravet syndrome, um, and okay. can be very effective to control these kids' seizures, right? Okay. Um, but if you go to the pack and ginser of Epidiolex, if you're going to have a kid on purified CBD Epidiolex, you have to monitor liver function because their transaminases go up. Uh, the other things you need to look out for is somnolence and sedation. And you have to look out for suicidal behavior and, and ideation. Even it's, with it's, CBD? It's in their package insert, the purified CBD. And actually, um, the book I edited, the, the folks from University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, Drs. Gaston and Slavarsky, 
that did the pioneer work on pediatric seizure and epidiolex and got it fast-tracked to be an FDA-approved medication, uh, they wrote my seizure chapter. Um, and, and it's fascinating um, how it works in the brain on that. Right. But the FDA actually issued a warning a couple months ago, don't use CBD in drive because of sedation. Okay. It's not going to get you stoned, but it might make you impaired enough or tired or sleepy or somnolent enough that you may be at risk. And they, okay. the FDA also warns on don't operate heavy machinery or heavy equipment, just like any other potential substance. So CBD, I think is, you know, years ago, I'm like, this is it. This is going to be the answer to our opioid epidemic. Right. And I was on board and then it, it kind of fell flat. But I, I do think that there is something there. Uh, and I, and I do support that we need to, you know, give me the medication that's purified, went through the clinical trials and I'm fine. Um, but you know, JAMA, I don't know if I sent you these articles, but they went to regulated markets and a lot of these products in regulated markets are mislabeled, um, and what's in the bottles, not on the label. So I tell my patients, buyer beware, uh, because there were, there was a, a, a teacher, uh, that was almost, he was going to be fired because he took a CBD product or a hemp product. Um, and there was THC in it, uh, because a lot of these hemp products are loaded with THC and there's no labeling. Oh, right. Like for instance, Charlotte's web oil. I'm sure you've heard of that. Uh, Charlotte Fiji. Uh, she was a young girl who Stanley moved to Colorado to get her seizures under control. Uh, she was on Sanjay Gupta's weed series. Uh, he promoting CBD. Uh, mm -hmm. she recently uh, passed away. Unfortunately, I know her family, her father and I uh, mountain bike together. Um, or her stepdad, I should say. Uh, we're mountain bike buddies, uh, ski buddies, so I've known the family uh, for a while. Uh, but they sell this product at a grocery store over the counter, and it's Charlotte's hemp oil. Mm -hmm. And I have the certificate of analysis, a 30cc vial of hemp oil, which is the equivalent like a cap of NyQuil, has 84 milligrams of THC in it. That's a lot of THC. And so right. there's nothing to prevent a 22-year-old to go buy a little vial they're expensive but he's got the cash he can shoot it before he hits the front door and get the and then drive home or get on the highway and he's already ingested over eight gummy bears worth of thc so so your warning about cbd is not necessarily that it's uh not necessarily a bad product per se it's that there's so many different uh companies producing it that you never know what you're getting that's exactly my point. I mean, it's, it's, it's not psychoactive. It's not going to get you high like THC. Right. Uh, there actually may be some uh, protective qualities in the lung and in the brain with CBD. So I think there's definitely some positives there. Uh, but I really think it's important that our, our medical community really know all, the whole thing about it, about, you know, warnings, you know, follow their liver functions. And, and a lot of these products, these artisanal products are being made in someone's basement, garage, or kitchen. And so you don't even know what you're going to get. Um, and like, for instance, the state of Oregon audited their marijuana program, the entire kit and caboodle, and they were only able to look at the, only 3% of their stores had a compliance inspection, 3%. And the state of Oregon's audit report last year basically said, we cannot guarantee that these products are safe for human consumption. There's solvents, there's E. coli, there's salmonella, there's pesticides in it. And that's a very regulated market. And they only expected 3% of their stores for compliance. Wow. That's a fail. So if, some, if a doctor is, you know, wants to get involved with CBD, are you saying that the only one that they should even do is the one that's the, you know, the FDA regulated one? Is that the only the, option? That, well, yes and no. I think the problem, is, and, and this is where my, my uh, distaste to big pharma and big insurance comes into play. Yeah. We have a purified CBD product that's available. Right now, it's FDA approved for a very narrow window of diagnoses. Right. But it may have benefit in a lot of areas that warrant investigation. And I am all for investigating CBD in a variety of conditions. You know, does it help with A, B, C, and D? If it does, prove it to me. Give me a product that's not going to be contaminated that what's in the bottle is on the label and the patients know the warnings and precautions and people don't know this CBD has over 500 drug interactions. 
If you go to drugs.com and look up cannabidiol, 520-ish drug interactions, nine of which are major. And in my world of pain, one of the major drug interactions is buprenorphine, which is the medication used for opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. the, the major drug interaction is sedation. You know, and the way it works in the liver, it might bump off the buprenorphine. So you may be at risk for an accidental overdose, perhaps. And a lot of common stuff that we use, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, other pain relievers are on that list of potential drug interactions. It has a very concerning drug interaction with Coumadin or Warfarin, which is a blood thinner. Um, it has interactions with anti-seizure medications. I mean, the president of the, um, the, the American Epilepsy Society wrote a letter saying the problem is that a lot of physicians that are recommending aren't epileptologists, they're not pediatric neurologists, they're making these recommendations and some of the actual epileptologists in Denver are at the bedside with uh, kids that are having um, uh, retro, their, their um, behavior uh, retrogression, they're having increased seizures, um, and there's some other medical concerns because they were using these artisanal products that who knows why they precipitated the seizure. I mean, there's evidence that cannabinoids might be pro-epileptogenic. So it's, it's not a simple answer. Is it's it's uh, not going to get you high, therefore it's fine. It's like any other substance. I mean, if you look at the PDR and you look at acetaminophen, there's a laundry list of potential side effects and, and stuff going on and liver toxicity. But they don't recommend that you follow your liver functions if you're going to take some Tylenol, but they do if you're going to if they you're going to use the FDA approved CBD medication. I bet a lot of doctors had no idea about that. I hear it all the time, which is yeah. why I, I do what I do. And I, I do appreciate the opportunity to get some of this out there. Again, I'm not a nihilist. I mean, I've, I've made marijuana recommendations to some of my patients in my practice. So, I mean, it's not like I'm a prohibitionist uh, and you and I are both scientists. I mean, show me the science, give me the data. I'll evaluate the data. And if it's something that's doable and it's purified and the patients can be safe, fine. I have no problems with that. Are there a lot of um, current ongoing tests for for like real you know CBD right now that are that are that can show the benefits for other things? I am I am unaware of anything off the top of my head. Again, when I was on our scientific advisory council, we uh, we approved nine million dollars worth of study. I think there were nine studies. Uh, one of them, I think, was a CBD study. And I after I left the committee, I don't know what happened to that study. Uh, if you do go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov and you put in that CBD or cannabidiol, I'm sure you'll get a, a lot of hits mm -hmm. on ongoing research. Um, you know, I think there's definitely some benefits based on how much I know uh, in terms of uh, neuroprotection, perhaps for addiction. There's evidence maybe something helpful for opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something to prevent uh, smokers from getting cancer. I mean, there, there's definitely some pros. There's a laundry list of pros but there's a laundry list of cons. And I think we need to, as a uh, medical community, sort that out. What about uh, for sleep? I mean, you know, if you, if somebody's coming for a sleep problem and, and, you know, instead of giving them something like a, you know, a Lunesta or, you know, Ambien or something like that. Right. What's the um, again, I tell my patients, fire beware. And then you have, you have to also take into consideration, maybe there are other, uh, underlying medical comorbidities. Um, so a lot of elderly people are on a laundry list of drugs. Right. Um, I, for, I have a, here's, a, here's an anecdote. Again, it doesn't make science, but it's, it's a very interesting anecdote. I have a, a patient who's a heart transplant mm -hmm. recipient, um, and he has chronic sternal pain uh, because he's had his chest cracked, heart out, heart in, repaired, plate infected, chest cracked, replaced mm -hmm. the plate. So he's had this chronic severe sternal pain, and he's on a moderate amount of opioid, right? Yeah. And we don't like to escalate patients on their opioids. We want to either maintain their stability or taper them down, mm -hmm. right? So he comes in, he goes, hey, I'm taking them, I'm using the CBD product because my story, my friend's mom had a heart transplant. So my friend started a marijuana dispensary and he's giving me the product out the back door. I'm like, well, I didn't want to hear that. That's illegal to do. You need a marijuana card, but let me talk to your transplant pharmacist first. Yeah. And so I called his transplant pharmacist and I said, this guy's using CBD or says he is because I don't know what he's really using. And he goes, no bueno. I go, what do you mean? He said, because 
and, and this, his pharmacist actually presented, he's, he's at the University of Colorado in Denver, uh, pharmacology department. He presented at a national pharmacology meeting uh, a paper on organ transplant recipients that are using CBD are having a hard time maintaining anti-rejection levels of medication because those medications compete with CBD at the cytochrome 3A4. And so these other patients that are gobbling up CBD may be at risk of organ rejection. Wow. So just one anecdote, and I, and I read up on it, and yeah, there's, there's definitely some hepatic issues. Again, if you're gonna use purified CBD, you gotta follow liver functions. It's in the package insert of Epidiolex. So if you're recommending it, this is definitely something you need to, to see if there's a, if it uh, can affect the other drugs that this person may tell you they're taking or yes, you not even exactly. know. You because know, if somebody comes into me on Suboxone and says, I want to use CBD, I'm like, oh, that's probably not a good drug interaction just because I happen to know. But, you know, I did not like pharmacology. I don't like all that stuff, but I learned a lot about cannabinoids and how they work in the body. Um, you know, if you kind of have a patient on, Suboxone or buprenorphine or other opioids, you know, one of the most common things I hear from my patients is it does make them sleepy. Mm -hmm. When I when I pin them down, I said, "Does it help for your pain?" I never hear. I rarely hear that. Uh, not just with CBD, but with just kind of uh, dispensary cannabis, because you know the the European F Pain Federation does not recommend co-prescribing cannabis-based medications, which aren't available in the U.S. really, except for Marinol and Sesame but they're really tightly regulated because my one patient, the heart transplant guy, um, I tried to get him on some Dronabinol, which has been around since 86. It was created, it's a synthetic THC created for chemotherapy associated nausea. And they said they, he was denied because it was off label, right? Mm. But it was an option for this guy and I was trying to get, he didn't want to go up on his opioids, but he was really suffering because of his sternal pain. Right. But he, and well, his transplant pharmacist and I cautioned him about the use of cannabinoids with his anti-rejection medications. Um, so I think you have to take those things into consideration if you're going to be recommending uh, any type of cannabinoid for a patient. Right. And, and well, especially now with the, the THC being available at various, uh, how many states or is it legal in actually? I believe it's 33 states. Last I checked, it was 33, straight, 33 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, have some sort of marijuana program. I think there's eight or more uh, states that legalize for recreational use. Right. Um, but again, I, I think this, this is, I think we're, at the end of the day, my biggest concerns is our future generation and our kids. You know, we're normalizing drug use. We are promoting uh, another addiction for profit industry, just like big tobacco was. Uh, uh, the, the patients I was referring to earlier that are 97% are there for cannabis use disorder when they're uh, having substance uh, use treatment issues and need treatment, more than 20% of those kids get their weed from their parents. Wow. More than 20%. So, I mean, we're really normalizing the fact that this is really bad for the brain. I mean, if you're, I think the age should be 25 or older. I don't care what you do at home. If you want to use marijuana at home and you're over 25 and your brain's fully developed, I don't care. I, that's not my beef. My beef is with um, pushing this, the, the, uh, the idea that it's safe and it's herbal and it's medicinal to our youth uh, when their brains are continuing to develop um, because these kids are struggling uh, with addiction issues. Uh, they're struggling with mental health issues. Marijuana is the most prevalent substance found in completed teen suicide in Colorado. I'll say that again. Marijuana is the most prevalent substance found in completed teen suicide in the state of Colorado. And interestingly, it used to be alcohol. Right. Number one. The trend reversed in 2012, which coincided with legalization. Correlation doesn't mean causation, but it's remained number one ever since then. So why, why is that? Well, we're normalizing the use of a substance that might have trouble. It's a chicken and egg argument. Are they depressed so they're using, or are they using because they're depressed? Um, they don't, they're not killing themselves with marijuana. But whenever a kid is dead in Colorado, nearly 20% of the time, marijuana is present. It's hmm. 19 point something percent. What about nationwide? Have you looked into that or, or do you even know? 
Well, I don't know all the data from the from nationally, but I do I do know this because um, I've spoken to the Texas Pain Society several times. I'm actually speaking to the Texas Medical Association uh, in during COVID via video webinar. Um, if you look at the uh, child abuse or neglect fatality in the state of Texas, mm -hmm. and Texas is about 10 percent of this of the nation's population, so probably a good representation of the the U.S. population. That's good. Yeah. But but if you have um, a, a dead child from neglect or abuse in the state of Texas, the most prevalent substance found by perpetrator, either active use or past use, is marijuana. And guess what the second substance found is? Not alcohol? Nothing. <laughs> I, okay. nothing 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 you set me up <laughs> I, I, well not on purpose but I, I, just to illustrate a point um that i'm not saying these kids are dying from marijuana toxicity right but the, per, the guardian is most often the substance is most often found in a kid that dies from neglect or, or abuse it's marijuana followed by nothing and then and i'll send you the graphic way below is then you get into the alcohol the, the opioids right. is very very low uh, methamphetamine. So, okay. Here's my question. Sure. Have you, or does this transcend um, financial resources? How do you mean? Have you seen that the people that let's say the, 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 the suicide situation is more in underprivileged families or the, the problems with um, just uh, marijuana in general are in different financial demographics than say, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, because alcohol kind of tends to drift all over the place, I would imagine. But yeah. it does marijuana do the same thing or CB? Well, yeah, let's just say marijuana. Is it more in the so socially, the, the lower, uh, I guess, lower class, uh, whatever we want to call that uh, arena? Is that where it is more of? More you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I don't have a good answer to that. If you're talking specifically about the suicide data, I don't know how they yeah. break out the demographics on that. Because um, I mean, it was it they, you know, they're more prevalent and to do suicide because their, you know, finances suck and marijuana is cheap to, and easy to get. And then they just kind of, you know, they use it. So it's hard to say, you know, I just want to know if they, it has if there's a direct, if they're, if they're the reason they, they do it is because of the marijuana or they're doing marijuana to try to pacify the pain that they're having. And uh, that's just an inexpensive, easy way to do it. Well, that's the argument. It's a chicken and egg argument. But you bring up a very good point that I'm going to highlight is that um, the industry, again, is following very similar playbooks to alcohol and tobacco because in the state of Colorado, guess where all of the or the where are the marijuana stores concentrated they are concentrated in poor communities of color that's that's what i was wondering yes and that's that's true They're, you're not going to find a marijuana dispensary next to the mayor's mansion the governor's <laughs> mansion right <laughs> yeah that makes sense you're, you're just not going to find it there right um, they, they, it, it's right where all the alcohol stores are and where all the tobacco and vaping stores are they're in very poor communities of color. And, and that's where the, the argument of social justice, which I don't want to go down that road, that's where the argument falls flat. Okay. Uh, they are tar it's, this is an addiction for profit industry. There's uh, a lot of money at stake. There's a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the, the, the revenue generated by the, the marijuana industry. In Cal uh, how, how much, what is it in Colorado? Do you know? It's a lot, but th th you, this is another good point. Um, <laughs> I'm going to use, I think it's 2018. I'm going to use that as a, as, as a data point. Um, the, the, the amount of money generated per year has gone up over time. The sales, cumulative sales have hit over a billion in Colorado. So it's a lot of money being, a lot of pot being sold, right? The revenue generated, I want to say it's 2018, 17 or 18, but I'm going to say it's 2018 was about $250 million in revenue. Okay. That's a lot of money, right? Yeah. It's not chump change. No. But it's only 0.9% of the state budget. It's less than 1% of the state budget. So it's not a cash cow. And if you look at every other state, California, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, all of them fell flat on their face when they promised the voters that they're going to make a ton of money and solve all their problems by generating millions and millions of dollars. That's not the case. Alaska, for instance, their 
I think in 2018 or 19, marijuana sales was 0.12% of their budget. And in Colorado, it's less than 1%. Every state that's legalized has been less than 1% of their budget. But I mean, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You're saying it, it's, a, it's a bad thing because they didn't generate enough revenue because the, the state promised they would if they made it legal? Well, that's part of the issue. And, and I think that the problem is that our state legislators can't spell P&L. Uh, <laughs> they, talk, they, they talk a lot about profit, but they never talk about loss. And so, for instance, I actually published a paper in my community between 2009 and 2014, one medium-sized hospital lost $20 million just from marijuana-related ER visits. And if you take that number across the state of Colorado, because there's only 25 ERs in our state, um, I think that was like a 250, mil no, it was a $59 million healthcare price tag. And if you look at, per year, that's about $90 million on average. And, average and how is that number, uh, what does that number represent exactly? You said marijuana, so what I, it was a very, I didn't realize how complicated hospital billing was, number one. <laughs> Uh, number two, okay. what I did is I, I went to the hospital and we did a retrospective review of patient charts that had a drug test. Okay. We, we filtered them by those that had marijuana only in their urine drug tests when they presented the hospital. And then we cross referenced it to diagnosis codes and all this other stuff. And I presented it to the CFO and he signed an attestation. Yep. 20 million. I don't, I don't just, I'm not going to argue with that. Mm -hmm. So so you look at the state data, that's about $89 million a year on average. Um, and you've heard of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, right? Cyclic vomiting, uh, people that smoke marijuana, they, get, they puke. Um, okay. There's an ER physician from San Diego who coined the term scrometing. It's almost pathognomonic for somebody that has cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. They're screaming and vomiting at the same time. Is it because uh, of overdose or overuse? It's, it's because how their body's reacting to it. Is it, because, is it like a first time or, or is it something that they've been using and then suddenly this happens? Nobody knows the, Nobody all knows. the okay. answers to it. Okay. Um, and there's actually a Facebook page that I've been following called Recovery from Cannabinoid Hyperemesis. And the stories on there are unbelievable for these people that are posting. Are they crazy people making stuff up? I don't know, maybe. But there's a lot of stories out there. But, it, but an ER colleague of mine said the cost of one cannabinoid hyperemesis patient is about 6500 bucks right? And there's 25 ERs in the state of Colorado. And, and I think her numbers, you let one patient per ER per day, that was another, like, I don't know what the numbers were off the top of my head, another $50 million in healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. But my colleagues that are ER physicians here say, they tell me, they see two to three of those patients per doctor per shift Wow! in one hospital. So that 50 million is probably a low ball, right? Yeah. And then if you look at the driving fatality data, we had 144 million, uh, 144 million, we had about 115 marijuana related driving fatalities in the state. And the National Traffic Safety Administration report says the cost of any driving fatality, doesn't matter if I fall asleep at the wheel, uh, the cost of any driving fatality, I mean, property, indemnity, life insurance, mm -hmm. is about $1.4 million per driving fatality. And yeah. we had 115 deaths that's another 144 million in the loss column. Well, how does that compare to say the, the drinking and driving situation? I mean, how many people died based More. on that? Again, we didn't do a good job with alcohol and a lot okay. of people are, are, <laughs> are, are co-abusing substances. Yes. So a lot of poly substance use. So it's right. hard to tease out some of those numbers. Um, but the interesting thing is, and I didn't know this until I did some research, is, you know, everyone's like, well, you know, why shouldn't anybody smoke a joint instead of having a glass of wine? Right? Which, the, which, which is a better evil. <laughs> which, might be, which is a better evil, right? But since we legalized, and I have, I have the data from the Colorado tobacco, to, uh, not tobacco, to the Colorado um, Alcohol Bureau, uh, in terms of the volume of alcohol sales went through the roof after we legalized. So we're actually drinking more in Colorado. Oh, Okay, so they just they did they added they didn't replace they, they didn't they didn't substitute they just <laughs> addition instead is of that what happened it, it is don't you think that's what happened with the opioid problem they just Absolutely. they just added it and said you know it maybe magnifies my uh, my my pain relief right. a little better with my drug well I've had patients say you know I drink to, for my pain control I'm like well that's not a good healthy choice no 
you know, because, you, you, you know, in my, with, with everything I know, I mean, when you smoke cigarettes, the target organ is the lung. When you drink a lot of alcohol, the target organ is the liver and the brain. And in, and in marijuana or cannabinoids, the target organ is the brain. It's a centrally acting substance. Um, and that's one of the reasons we don't want kids to use uh, because we want to protect their brain. Right. But why are, why are more kids dying, committing suicide? Why is marijuana more prevalent? Um, is, that, is the suicide um, um, like that, uh, like say in California as well? Or do you know? I don't know, I don't know the data from California. Okay. Because they, they have a, don't they have a, they, they're legalized for how long? Do you know? They're legal for about a year or so. Oh, so it's that, new for them. Medical has been around since 96. Okay. I'm, I'm curious about, well, it, there's no way to know, especially with everybody staying at home now. It's COVID. I know. This yeah. With the, mental, mental health, right? Yeah. This, this, like I actually, when I got the, um, the, the child neglect fatality data, I asked yeah. the state of Texas, I said, do you track this information? And they don't track it. Oh. The suicide data, they don't track toxicology on suicide, adolescent suicides. And so though. When, when, when in the retrospect, the retroscope's always 2020. The things that I recommend when people ask me, if, if you had to do anything different, I would say cap potency at 10% or less, um, tightly regulate and test, um, educate kids in elementary school, educate parents. Um, what are the other things? Oh, mandatory drug testing on suicides, mandatory drug testing on violence violent crimes uh, or any type of homicide or murder. Uh, there was a, 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 an incident in California, and you hear about this all the time, cannabis psychosis is a real thing. Um, there was a, a girl who was hearing impaired. Uh, cannabis psychosis? Yes, okay. cannabis psychosis. And actually the, 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 uh, the, there was a nice paper from DeForti, her name was uh, DeForti was her name, and she published a European paper in Amsterdam and London that first episode psychosis is associated with marijuana use of more than 10% THC. First episode psychosis. And then there's that, there's that overlap between psychosis and schizophrenia. So there's a very strong correlation to cannabis use and schizophrenia, although I'm not going to go out and say it causes it. Right. But there's a very strong correlation and 10% is kind of the ceiling. So you should have mandatory drug testing on violent crimes, murders, homicides. Uh, you need to educate regarding driving impairment. You need to get these kids early on. And we, we may not even, even have the time to talk about in utero exposures and what happens to those kids. You know, there's a, one of the potential authors I had for my book uh, was- What's the name of your book, by the way? It's a Cannabis in Medicine, an Evidence-Based Approach. Very nice. From Springer. Um, but there was a potential author I had who was a psychiatrist from Western Australia, and he published a paper that he was looking at the U.S. from afar that- Mar in the U.S., marijuana, medical marijuana states have a 20% higher incidence of autism, which I found fascinating. Um, and it, the other thing, there was a lady from Duke. Her name was um, Dr. Murphy. I'm trying to think of her first name. Uh, she published a paper within the past six months that men who use alter the autism gene, because they always point at the finger at the woman. Now ah, you shouldn't be drinking and smoking cigarettes and using pot. Well, actually, the, the dad the biological father might have been using and, and altered the autism gene and then whoop, they have an autistic child. So there's, there's other data about birth defects. It's a potential teratogen, uh, wow. autism rates. I mean, there's, it's so much that this spans a huge spectrum of issues. This is not whether or not, well, CBD is safe or not safe, uh, or I should have the right to use cannabis. This is really a medical issue uh, that, that transcends every aspect of medicine. I mean, arrhythmias, myocardial infarctions, pulmonary disease, uh, use in cancer, palliative care, pediatrics, emergency medicine, um, you name it, movement disorders, multiple sclerosis. There's, it's so broad. And that's why I, the impetus for the book was because you know, there's no resource for our colleagues. And in the book, tell me more about that. Um, what, what is it kind of, what is the theme and, and what is it that I guess, what, what, what can you tell me about the book? Well, basically, it's a, it's a, it's a reference, um, you know, for anybody that has an interest in, you know, anything marijuana. I had, I, I want to cover basic science. So I had a neurobiologist from uh, Harvard do a neurobiology section, how it works in the brain. Yeah. And I had a guy who was a, a toxicologist 
talk about the molecules, the THC, CBD, and hemp, what the molecules do. I have a pharmacologist doing drug interactions. Um, and then I kind of go into different areas of medicine that are known for potential use. I have a dermatology section, ophthalmology, uh, MS, movement disorders, seizures, uh, addiction, uh, behavior, suicidality, uh, pain, pediatrics, uh, in utero exposures, driving impairment, public health issues, uh, legal implications for doctors I might recommend. Uh, like for instance, in Colorado, if I make a recommendation to you and then you run over Mrs. Smith, uh, Mrs. Smith, Mr. Smith can't sue you or the dispensary where you got your weed from, but they can come after me because the law in Colorado does not protect the recommending physician. Wow. That's not good. No, it's not good at all. But that's, but our colleagues don't know this. And that was kind of the impetus because I always get a deer in the headlights and I always get a lot of, I didn't know. Uh, anything about, you know, arrhythmia or in utero exposures. Um, and so that was the impetus for the book because there's nothing out there. So if you're a physician that's uh, considering or recommending T um, THC, marijuana, or even CBD, this is a manual you need to have, correct? I think so. Can you uh, show the book again? It, it switched to me when you, when you, hold on. It's, Talk. You have to talk so it switches. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a Cannabis and Medicine and Evidence-Based Approach. Uh, it's published by Springer Publishing that does a lot of uh, medical publications. Uh, it is available on Amazon. You can do it on Kindle. You have electronic downloads. Uh, it's really a reference. It, and the, the, there really is no underlying theme of marijuana is bad for you or marijuana is great for you. Um, I didn't author anything. I just compiled a list of people, experts in their field. Um, to say what is the state of the evidence in your field and put it in this book. So I have a guy from Brazil that's a, a world-renowned expert in cardiology, and he was talking about how it affects the coronary blood vessels and the cerebral blood vessels and why there's a risk of arrhythmia and heart attack uh, and stroke with cannabis. Wow. Yeah, this is a totally new thing for me. I, I had no idea that it was so bad. I hear that a lot. So don't feel bad. Don't feel bad I mean, at all. You know, when you got celebrities like Snoop Dogg talking about how wonderful it is. <laughs> well, well, you know, you t talk about celebrities, you know, you had, um, who was the Melissa Etheridge? Yep. Her son passed away from a drug overdose, which, which was interesting because number one, we never got his toxicology. Uh, number two, she was very clear on how much pot she used to smoke with this kid. Right. When he started at 13. So, Gateway, an example. There's been several celebrities that have lost children recently to opioid overdose, right? They all began at a very young age. The, the target organ is the brain. And these kids, their brain is developing all the way through 25 or beyond. Um, it, it shouldn't be 21 for marijuana in my mind. I think it should be 25. After 25, your brain's developed. You make, I don't care what you do at home. Just don't run me over, right? Don't go psychotic. On, like right. there was something in New York City, the, 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 um, the head of some large uh, IT thing was found dismembered in his apartment. I don't know if you saw that that hit the news. I, I there, was a, there was a guy in another state that got his head chopped off by one of his tenants. Was there cannabis psychosis? I don't know. We had, you've heard of the Planned Parenthood shooter right here in Colorado Springs? Uh, no. A couple years ago. Yeah, the guy, guy went crazy and he shot up Planned Parenthood because he was just whatever, crazy. Yeah. Um, he was a marijuana connoisseur. He moved here to smoke marijuana. He had Facebook pages of how to meet people to smoke weed. Uh, he's been declared incompetent to stay in trial. So every year he comes up, he's still incompetent. Three weeks before that, we had a shooter in the downtown area of our community. Uh, guy was carrying an AR-15 through downtown Colorado Springs, shot three people dead. Cops came, he ended up getting shot, and I have his autopsy report, and there was only one substance on his toxicology. I can guess. <laughs> Take a guess. Take a guess what that was. <laughs> THC? One sub <laughs> THC. Marijuana? Yeah. So, in, again, cannabis psychosis is real. Um, I would encourage you, if you're a parent, uh, to read Alex Berenson's book, Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana, Mental Illness, and Violence. Uh, it's fascinating. I, know, I knew a lot in the book because I, I knew it. Uh, but a lot of people that I know didn't know it. Um, and it's, it's frightening. It's really about 
protecting our kids and our future generation. Uh, because the studies show if you're exposed in utero, um, that kid, even if that kid doesn't use, as they grow older, they may have problems with behavior, aggression, um, drug-seeking behavior, and then that gets passed on to future generations. Th mm. Those have been shown in, in monkey and, and other animal studies, that it's intergenerational. So we, I think we're really poised to lose another generation of kids. Wow. Unfortunately. <sighs> okay. Well, this is a, should, should serve as a, as, a, as a warning for everybody listening, including doctors, as well as any potential, you know, general public that are, are listening that didn't know there's actually some downsides that we need to be aware of. Yeah, I, thank you for the opportunity. I don't want to be a downer on a Friday, but, you know, I think it's really about uh, providing our community with evidence and the science. And again, I'm not a nihilist. I mean, I've made recommendations for people. Um, I follow them closely. I, 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 you have to be aware of drug interactions because uh, you don't want to do any harm uh, to your patients. Um, and I think there's definitely some benefits. Right. You, know, you really need to put it through the rigor. And, and, and I, I'll bite off on that any day. Well, Dr. Finn, thank you so much for your time. Did we miss anything that you wanted to cover? Or we got everything. Oh, you didn't get everything. Well, <laughs> I, maybe we could save it for another time because I'll probably have lots of questions uh, after sure. this. this, this. Sure. So if, if you are uh, watching this and you have questions, please submit them and uh, I, will, uh, I will present them to uh, Dr. Finn. Oh, that'd be awesome. More yeah, yeah. Help. Awesome. Well, Dr. Finn, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much Take for care. taking time out of your busy schedule. And I wish you much success. And I look forward to speaking to you again sometime in the future. Yeah. And read my book. And if you have any questions, I appreciate the feedback. Absolutely. You have a good one. Thank you, you for your time. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks.